You are listening to The Building Code, a podcast by Builder Trend, where we talk all things technology and construction. Be sure to stick around to the end of the episode where you can find out how to be a part of The Building Code crew. Let's get it. All right, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of The Building Code, a special uh, regional series we're doing here looking back in 2020. Today, very happy to have a friend of Builder Trend. Uh, we have Paul Lede from Chris Lede Homes. Welcome, Paul, to the show. All right, y'all. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Why don't we start start here? You're in our southeast region, uh, part of the uh, podcast. Um, can you just tell me about your company name, your name, and sort of the the rundown of uh, of your business? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, I'm Paul Lede. Um, the name of our company is Chris Lede Homes. It's a company my dad started almost 40 years ago. So I'm second generation home builder. You know, my my dad built you know, built the company up in the eighties, went through the, the oil field crash, barely made it through that. Um, he can remember, you know, almost picking up and leaving in the eighties and going find work. And he built a good name, uh, obviously, and kind of made himself, a um, an icon, I guess, as a builder here, uh, as one of the premier builders and good reputation. We take care of our stuff. We follow up at, after the job. And, and we kind of built on that foundation and basically we've over the last maybe six years have been with builder trend um, or maybe five, five or six. Uh, we basically been taking it from a mom and pop paper to completely changed it to, um, you know, uh, online based yeah. uh, computer based. I've been, uh, I guess, owner of the company for about four years now. So, um, you know, that's been good. My dad works for me. <laughs> um, and, uh, just a couple hours, uh, but he does a lot, you know, he helps with some estimating and, um, keep him in the office. And so, um, how, how are those, also have, how are those annual what, reviews with your dad? How are the, how, how are they, they? An, the annual reviews? Yeah. How he did, <laughs> what he can improve on. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, do that, right? uh, I find he works, he goes through phases. He doesn't want to work, yeah. uh, as much. And then he's like, man, I'm don't have anything to do. And then he, we give him some stuff to do and then he gets overwhelmed and then we pull back and then it's like a seesaw. And then he'll find something to keep him, keep him distracted. Then he comes back like, what do y'all need me to do? <laughs> so, um, no, it's, it's good. It's, uh, well, that's I, good. look, I'm very fortunate to have him. Uh, he's taught me a lot and we talk some day, some weeks we won't talk just cause we're both tied up, but he's always there for a phone call. That's know? great. Yeah. And, that's a ton of uh, he, knowledge there for you to lean on. He, we, yeah. I, we call it a 40 years of mistakes. So he does come check. He likes to go check on these jobs in different phases right before we pour foundation. It's always, we, like we said, I don't want to make a mistake that he made already. So mm -hmm. it's just having that extra set of eyes is always good. Yeah, you for know? sure. And, and how many other employees do you have now? So now it's me and uh, two uh, two girls. I have an office manager, and I have like a marketing and sales um, um, girl. They're both um, both friends of or both uh, you know wives and a fiance, friends of the family. That man, just dumb luck. I got they landed in my lap, and um, and I was looking for someone. Uh, I guess into the year last year, um, and Kate, she's our uh, office manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, come to find out, she always wanted to be an accountant, but you know, her mom wouldn't let her go through it in a, in college. But she's certainly, you know, really good, <laughs> really good at it. So we we found that out at the beginning of the year, and then um, just man, the phone calls. I was having a hard time keeping up with leads, and um, you know, following up and and keeping that stream of of customers in. And so uh, I made a decision in October of this year to uh, hire on another girl to kind of help with that and streamline it, that mm -hmm. process and then work with our customers and selections and stuff. So it was just becoming too much for me and Kate to mm -hmm. handle, you know, and um, it's been good, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's a small it's a small crew for for, you know, being in business for 40 years. Um, yeah. But so how many jobs do you guys like to do a year? Like what's your typical target? that you're trying to hit about 10 to 12 a year. Um, Jeez, that's a, that's a really small team for 10 to 12 a year. You got a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we honestly, you know, we never did that much before 
but you know, I was with builder training, you know, it really makes it easy. Um, I got a fantastic sub base, uh, subcontractor, uh, force that, you know, really took me a little while and, and vendors, you know, it took them a while to get a, in the groove, but I've got a good solid group that, man, they just really bought into the whole concept of, um, you know, being alerted when the job's coming up, bidding, I mean, just bidding alone, um, and the ease of that has really allowed us to, to go after a lot more because we're so much more efficient. Um, mm -hmm. and then of course they follow the program and then they're, you know, now they're getting paid through it and then they just see how easy it is. And it just, all of that extra work that it used to take to write checks and follow up and do this and do that. I mean, builder trend does, does 80% of the work, you know, yeah. you just have to have it. The, you got to have everything in place. You know, right. Yeah. Kind words. Really appreciate that. I mean, I, I you know, you're a friend of of the company. There's a yeah. there, you know, there's a small group because you've been here. I know you've been have you been here once uh, to Omaha for Build uh, University tw twice. I thought I've so. Been yeah. Twice. Yeah. Yeah. We've shared a couple of beers and some stories. And so we, we appreciate your yeah. friendship. We appreciate your kind words there. And of course, your business. So yeah. you're based out of uh, Louisiana. Um, what, right. what part? Cause I'm not super familiar. So I'm, um, I like to tell people, if you look at Baton Rouge and New Orleans on a map, um, I'm almost right in the middle of them, but 50 miles Southwest of New Orleans and 50 miles Southeast of Baton Rouge, okay. you know, so I'm, I'm down there. Um, we're about 25 miles from the coast. Um, you know, down here. Okay. So we're, um, I think the only other big town below us is uh, Homa. So. Okay. Um, so you, uh, so you got yeah. a you got a you got a big city, New Orleans, and you got a huge college town, Baton Rouge. That's right. I've always wanted to ask this, so so bear with me. Um, LSU won mm -hmm. the national championship uh, about a year ago, probably right. Yeah, about a, a year, year ago. ago. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday or today. Yeah, Do yeah. sales pick up at that time? <laughs> like, are people excited <laughs> and like you know, just huge LSU people, yeah. and they're like, well, they're elated, so like, screw it, we're going to spend some money. Um. Uh, I would say that, you know, after last year, maybe, you know, I think they got a little excited, but we're coming off a couple, couple bad years, you know, and this, this year was terrible, but, but no, we do get some extremely enthusiastic, um, you know, LSU fans that, 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 that makes a big, big difference, you know, when you're building a house during it, <laughs> during football season. That's what I'm saying. You know? Yeah. That, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so you're the first company we've spoken to from Louisiana. So let's just, just take it back to March, uh, you know, kind of March 15, 2020. What was it like then when we, you know, all collectively realized, okay, this is a real thing. This is happening. How, how did it affect mm -hmm. you and your team? I was, um, so I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I think, you know, kind of share with you a little earlier, I was building a new house, new office, new office and house. Um, so kind of, you know, personally, I had was, you know, going for a big milestone in my life. You know, I'm on third year of working with my, um, you know, of, of owning the business or fourth year of owning the business. We, uh, my office manager, Nancy, who's like a sister to me, we had been with the company for over 20 years, uh, we left in December. <laughs> so we were looking for somebody else to, to help fill the shoes. You know, so I already had a couple of gut wrenching things going on, just, just big changes, you know, et cetera. And, uh, man, when that happened, I was honestly, I was terrified for about a week, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. where are we going? Where's this going? You know, and, and you didn't know what to believe. You didn't know what to hear. I just heard a lot of, you know, they were talking about shutting us down, you know, our industry down, mm -hmm. um, as a whole. And, uh, you know, I had some big projects on them coming up and I didn't know if they were going to start, you know, and, and, you know, I had to make a decision after about a week that I can't just live in total fear and I'm going to follow the guidelines and the rules and I'm going to just keep powering on, you know, safely. And, you know, that's, that's what we did, but, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, it was a not big eye opener. I think as for, as a, a new adult, you know, 34 year old, you know, that, I think something that we experienced in March is probably, a, you know, a big life changing event that I don't think that we've, my, you know, our generation have really had, kind of that rocks the boat, you know, 
for us as, as adults. For sure. Know? For sure. I mean, the only thing I can think of is like, you know, the downturn in 2008 in the industry that your dad probably 2008, right. yeah, dealt with, yeah. but then also like nine 11, but like, it's sort of like of like that ilk. It's like, it was crazy. Uh, it was, you that's know, right. the, the unknown was the thing, right? And that's what everybody talks the about. And you talked about. So Every you have an day. interesting perspective. It felt like you were feeling like, okay, took over my dad's company. I'm the owner now. I'm getting my feet under me. Man, I'm having some success. Things yeah. are good. And then it's like, oh, man, is this all just going to fall <laughs> apart right in front of me? Pretty much. Right. Um, pretty much how I felt for about a week. I mean, it, yeah. it started to gradually go away. After fear left and you kind of just... You kind of just let go, man, and you, you know, um, things fell back in place, and it wasn't. Look, it was monumental at the time, but mm -hmm. it, it became less and less as the weeks went on, mm -hmm. um, and you just learned that, hey, look, this is the new norm, and you got to just, you got to just deal with it. You absolutely, know? absolutely, just kind of move forward, and you know. As an industry, I think that the owners that I talk to are really good at that stuff. You know, it's it's a yeah. it's an uncertain industry when you're building a home and you're dealing with so many different things, like you know, all these subcontractors and vendors, you know, these these city and, and state officials mm -hmm. for permits and things like that. You know, the weather, like you can't control things in this industry. So, I think we're set up well for that. And, you know, and and uh, you know, you start feeling the burden of having. Um, you've got some of your customers calling you, going like. What's it going to mean for us? Or, you know, what are we going to do? Like, oh, my, you know, and they start panicking and you mm -hmm. kind of like, then you have to become the voice of reason for 10 people that you, you frankly barely know mm -hmm. um, who, I mean, you learn, you, you know, we're good, good friends with them all now, you know, after a build, but, you know, and it, you know, that's a lot, you know, on your, on your plate um, at a time and, um, and, but I think that's what the, what's comforting about it is everybody's in the same boat. So yeah, um, there was definitely that feeling in it all across <laughs> the board. You know, typically when clients are like, you know, kind of nagging you about why aren't we done yet? Like there was not a lot of that mm -hmm. from what I hear. It's just like everybody kind of no. understood this is a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah, a lot of very very cool customers uh, during during that time period mm -hmm. that uh, everybody just understood. You know that no one really knew what you were getting into. Yeah. You know? So what's really interesting about uh, about this, Paul, is that you're sitting, uh, you know, Danielle, producer Danielle and I are looking at your video here. You're sitting in your office, sort of separated from your house. So it's crazy. Mm -hmm. You were building, or you said you just had a slab down when this hit. Yeah. Right? And so yep. did you did you make some uh, changes to the design during the build, knowing that this is kind of our new normal of this working in our home? No, well, I actually, with, you know, being that I was already – you know, I, I had builder trim and, um, I always knew that I wanted a, you know, in-home office separated. Mm -hmm. Now I will say some things did change with our working environment with the people who work for me. You know, I did not think that we would utilize this space as much as we are. Um, and I've conducted, a the house wouldn't even finish and I was doing zoom calls. I had internet set up early mm -hmm. and I was doing zoom meetings out of here because I had to, I had to find a way to communicate with potential customers and my current customers and my staff, you know? Um, so we, yeah, I mean, I guess to answer your question, it did kind of, um, some things did change during the build, um, which I guess set the tone for how I'm actually using it now. Mm -hmm. Um, very remote, um, you know, office kind of thing. good. Had you ever done a zoom call before that? I mean, I, I know that our company does those, but yeah. So, I mean, and when I, when I first got built a trend the first year, um, I built a house for a couple from Orlando and, mm -hmm. uh, they only came to the project maybe two or three times. Uh, so I knew about zoom and, you know, I was having zoom calls with, you know, this, this older customer and his wife who didn't really have a clue how to, <laughs> how to do it. But mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be able to see him face to face. Um, but, um, you know, and then basically I've had, I can, I can't even count how many zoom calls we've done in here <laughs> now. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've had seven between today and yesterday. That's so so crazy. are you, are you, yeah. are you recording them? I'm not recording them. Okay, there's I'm a, not. there's a tip we've realized from the regional podcast is that a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of construction owners, are recording these calls and then uploading them to the Build a Trend client portal 
or just sending them to the client so that we're all on the same page about what was said, you know, like that is smart. Here's yeah, what we talked about and, and they can review it. And so that's, that's a good little takeaway we've gotten. Okay. So, hmm. you know, you're like an interesting that. perspective because I think you're the first person we spoke to, um, that didn't have a, uh, a, a an office out of their home with, with a ton mm-hmm. of staff. And so this is, this is the whole point of this podcast series is to get different perspectives. So as a single business owner, you know, you're doing actually a lot of jobs for one person or one or two people. Um, what did the, the subsequent months look like? I know there was for many people, there was sort of this slowdown of like, nobody knew what to do. So we're pausing like leads and things like that. Did it quickly come back to you as it did for most people? It came, I almost feel like it, it never went away. You know, so we're, we're a little more rural. So I think that, um, that had a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. Had I been like in new Orleans or one of the cities, uh, it probably would have been a much different, but, um, it almost never stopped. And I can remember feeling like, what are these people doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm like, they're fearless. I'm fearless, you know, like, and, and it was very, uh, encouraging to still have people um, who didn't frankly care for mm-hmm. lack of a better term. And not that they didn't care about the virus, but they didn't care about what it could do to the economy or what it could do to the production of their home or, or what have you. They, I mean, it was like nothing happened yeah. and it was very encouraging and reassuring. And I think that helped me. Yeah. That, you know. is, that is refreshing because the first thing again, the health concerns aside, because I think we're all concerned about that right. stuff. And, and, you know, it's, it's been a really big deal, obviously, but it is encouraging that I think for the most part, people were like, you know, screw this. Like, we're not going to let this crash the economy. We're not going to, we're not going to be f- mm-hmm. afraid of this thing. And if we all right. do enough of us feel that way and do that, then the economy won't crash. Like the stock market stayed strong. So mm-hmm. I did feel that way. And that's, I think that was definitely one of the reasons for, the construction com- companies coming out of this or the industry coming out of this, you know, really in a positive way that, and, you know, interest rates went low. Um, is that kind of what you saw there? You, have you seen a really good year this year, despite everything? That's right. So, you know, we've had a really good year despite everything, you know, obviously, like you said, interest rates were, I think a really big, uh, you know, part of that. And I, I don't know what you call it, but I, I tell people it's, um, had a lot of a lot of cash people that you know sat on the money forever and didn't do their dream and then whatever the pandemic did to the to people psychologically you know they are basically like let's just get it let's do it mm-hmm. if we're not going to do it now we can't die with it what we need to just do this project and you know and i think it was like an eye opener for some people with that we're sitting on projects like we need to do it now. Yeah, that's really and, interesting. And right now. It's like that, you know, it's like that. I don't I don't I heard this story like, you know, guys would go, uh, you know, off to World War Two and then like the last day they would like tell their girlfriend like, honey, like, you know, this is the last shot. Like I, I might die. You know what I mean? It's like, and so they, yeah. they kind of use that to their advantage, but same thing with like end of the world stuff. It's like, well, what's the point? Like we got this, we want to do it. We have the money. Like you can't, you, you can't take it with you. Yeah. Can't take it with you. You know, um, Hey, look, you know, it looks like, you know, real estate's a better, better investment than what it, I had it in. So, yeah. you know, why not? And, um, yeah, a lot of people have, have said that. So looking to next year, you had a good year. What's next year look like for you guys? So, uh, so far, I mean, I mean, it looks like I'm going to be finishing some projects probably in February, March. Um, so it's be starting a project soon, which is a pretty cool story, uh, COVID story. Um, and about another, about another month we'll be getting started on that one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I've got two or three that are look like, um, probably April to get started. So, man, I, and not to mention the ones that I started in December of this year. So, I mean, we're, it's been good. You know, I'm thinking we'll have a good year uh, already. What, so, what's the COVID story? So, you know, this, there's this guy up in um contacts me he's he's uh transferring from you know another state and um never met him in person um gets my um looks us up online finds us online i have a couple zoom calls with him 
um, sharing my screen, explaining builder trend. He's real uh, nervous isn't the right word, but he's real concerned because he's, you know, he's, he can't move down here and can't come down here until September mm -hmm. and he's not going to be able to be here for the project. And, you know, long story short, you know, builder trend was, a, I guess, a huge, uh, asset, I guess, for me, um, in that regard. So I, I've actually never met him, uh, in person and, um, you know, building a nice home here in Thibodeau. And, um, I just think it's cool that, you know, I've never met the guy. Um, he saw a process, you know, uh, through, through some zoom calls and is confident in us that, that we can pull it off and he trusts us to, to get his house done, you know, correctly. And actually we're going to fly up there, um, the end of this month and, uh, finally go meet him face to face. Um, cause we, we haven't yet. Um, That's That's I just think it's cool what, you know, I, I may not have had that in place before um, COVID. Um, maybe I would have kind of figured it out because we did it with Orlando, but this was much different. I mean, you know, I was just going through our process that we had with Builder Trend, which I didn't really have it all together with a guy from Orlando. And man, it just, the transparency is going to be amazing for them and, you know, having videos and, and photos for them. Um, I, I just think he felt really confident that we can pull it off without him and his wife traveling down here. So, yeah, man, that's, um, that's the dream we've always had at build a trend. Honestly, it, it's, it's yeah. so cool to see that in real life. And again, I think, you know, you look back at 2020 and everybody's like 2020 sucks. Like this is the worst year of my life, the pandemic, but there's so many yeah. good things that have come out of it. Like again, this push, yeah. Uh, that everybody got into technology, which at the end of the day, right. it saves time. It saves money. It's, it's a net win, win for everybody. So mm -hmm. that's a great example of that. That's a really cool story. You have to keep us, keep us, uh, in the yeah. loop on that one. Maybe we'll have you, you know, we'll have you, when are you going to finish that job? You think September? Probably September. Right. Um, yeah. Well, let's, let's, so, we'll, we'll pencil you in for a return to the podcast, September, 2021. Danielle's writing that down. And then we'll, yeah. we'll like sort of unpack it and see how it all went. Yeah. I would love to do that. Um, and, um, love to share anything that I can, uh, with that. Yeah. Uh, I, and you're right. I mean, it, when I first got build a trend, I, it was the same thing. Like we did that one in Orlando and all we had set up was the selections, you know, but now it's set up. I mean, we're using every aspect of it, mm -hmm. of builder trend now. And I'm, I'm just, I'm really anxious to see how it's going to work um you know while they're over there so um and, yeah. and we're we're 1500 miles away you That's know so crazy <laughs> never met never yeah been. so yeah we'll definitely follow along and then uh, yeah. we'll have you on at the end and we'll see how it all how, all turned out cool all right man well good. we really appreciate you coming on uh this is the perfect yeah. time um you know great to hear that 2020 w was a good thing for you all in all um, yeah. you know, I'm looking at your cool house you got in your office and I'm a little <laughs> jealous. You know, he has a tap. He has a, he has a, a keg tap right next to his desk. I don't know if that's good or bad. He yeah. says, we, he, yeah, I got the idea from y'all. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Paul, it works well with, uh, with my customers. So <laughs> it's good. <laughs> yeah. Paul's been in Omaha twice for Builder Trend University and, and he, uh, love, loves the bar area. We have at Builder Trend that hasn't got any use in 10 months, by the way. So it's been long. Not but here. We're going to get that back. I might have to come back up there. Yeah, man. We'd love to have you. All right, man. Thank you so much. Um, really yeah. great to to see that, you know, next year is looking good. We'll have you back on in September. So stay tuned for that, everybody. Um, okay. Thanks, man. All right, dude. Have a good one. Yep. Take care. This is Sherwin Loudermilk from Loudermilk Homes in Atlanta, Georgia area and a few other places. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast. Let me start out by, by, uh, by this. Sherwin, why don't you just tell everybody your name, your company, and just kind of the profile of everything. Uh, Sherwin Loudermilk uh, with Loudermilk Homes. We're based in Atlanta, Georgia. We also just recently moved into the high, Highlands and Cashiers, North Carolina area. Uh, we have three divisions. Um, Oh, we wow. deal with high-end luxury custom homes. Okay. So, and how long have you guys been around? I I think it's 11 or 12 years. Okay, nice. And you're the owner? I am. Okay, and how many people do you have on your team? 
Last I checked, we have 28 uh, managers or middle managers. Uh, we don't self-perform anything, so so they're all, um, you know, organized project managers, superintendents, or office staff. Wow, that's a big staff. Uh, you guys must be doing some good volume. How many jobs did you do last year, and what does 2021 look like? Um. So we just actually did our projections for 2021, and we're looking at somewhere right around $63 million in sales. Um, we deal with high-end luxury custom homes, so our average sale price is about right around $2.2 million. Uh, so they're larger, you know, larger, more complicated deals that take, I guess our average cycle is about 15 months when you add pre-construction and construction together. Yeah. And, and do you project, I've got a lot of questions now. Uh, do you project that that length of build is going to go, uh, is going to lengthen even more than 15 months or is that sort of the new normal for you? 15 months? No, I think it's actually going to shrink. Uh, it extended because of COVID. So we're finding that, you know, getting permits that took two months are now taking three months. Um, you know, our plans actually have to go into a little holding cell, which they spray off. And then it takes a couple of days for the inspector to come out and take a look at them. You know, the, the plans have gone into quarantine. Um, so uh, so things like that, uh, we're noticing that um, there it's difficult to get uh, supplies, specific types of supplies. Dishwashers, for example, um, we were we were calling everywhere to get a Bosch dishwasher. We just couldn't. Um, garbage disposals for about two months were just non-existent. Um, we're finding now um, our refrigeration that we typically put in homes uh, has a three month delay in in getting it in. And so uh, those type of things have made it a little bit complicated. There are some vendors that just don't wanna work with multiple people in the house. Um, and, and I understand and, and we, we support that. Um, so it's pushing out that timeline. I think as COVID comes, um, comes to an end, we'll see that start shrinking down a little bit more. Um, we're very heavy on pre-construction uh, busy, bit, probably more heavy than, than almost any other custom builder I know. But in doing that, we we have a lot of planning and organization using builder trend for, for most of what we do. Um, and that results in us being able to have a shorter construction time frame because we're so organized on the back end. I see. So yeah, just explain if you could in your words what what being heavy on the pre-construction means. So we have every single selection picked out. Uh, maybe not the countertops because most countertop companies won't hold a slab for that long or mirrors because they change. But pretty much besides those couple of cosmetic items, we know every single thing that's going to go into the house. We've bought out the whole house up till sheetrock, including the cabinets, uh, before we put the first shovel in the ground. So we want to really analyze that house and make sure that it's perfect. Um, so we're working with the design teams, we're working with the architect, we're working with the civil engineer, we put put everything together. It's not just a, here's the house, let's go ahead and start framing and we'll figure out the rest of it as we go. We want to understand it. And what we find is by understanding it, we solve a lot of problems up front. So um, we tell our clients that even though it's, you, you know, it feels like it's taking forever in this pre-construction process, uh, we're going to save more time in the back end and cost because we're not having to rip things out uh, like, a you know, on a regular basis, um, you know, just to be able to understand what you want to put into the home. Yeah, that's really interesting because there's there's two philosophies. One is what you're doing. And obviously that that's super organized when we start digging and there's not a lot of changes or change orders or maybe there are. We can talk about that. But the other philosophy is and a lot of builders would say hey, I don't want my clients to pick out their selections until they can step into like the frame structure or something like that and kind of get a feel for it. Do you feel the way you guys are so heavy on pre-construction? Do you find problems later or n not at all? So we did. Uh, we have a, a very rigorous nine-step process. Um, the first three steps are in pre-construction and then the last six are during construction. And we're constantly revalidating things. So, um, so let's say by step three, which is our design phase, we have every single design picked out and selection picked out for the home. Well, as we're going through the next steps, for example, like lot six, uh, step six or seven, where we're really picking out the colors of the house and the, making sure that everything fits, uh, we'll go ahead and paint colors on every wall, you know, on multiple sides because the light shines differently. Mm -hmm. We'll put the stain color on the hardwood floors uh, we'll put the crown up, a few pieces of crown, and paint that too so that the clients really get a feel for 
for what were the selections that they made six months before? And are these still what the selections that they, they want to move forward with? They have the choice to make a change at that point. Um, some that will not cost any money, some that will, but at least everything is picked out and analyzed. Um, and we're not having to, you know, as long as they keep those same selections, there are no additional costs back to the clients. Um, you know, some, some builders say that, hey, you know, we made so much money on change orders. When you actually analyze, builders really don't make changes on, on or money on change orders unless you're charging 50, 60% or more. Which is which happens occasionally, you know, if you're in a specific time frame of the build. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, the change is causing incredible amount of delay, which causes cost. And so it's it's uh, we're, we're trying to cut the fat out by planning in advance. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's a good strategy to try to make money on change orders. You know, good change order manager is is just trying not to lose money. Right. Like right. we need to make sure that if they want to change, sure, we'll make that change. But, you know, we need to charge them for the extra cost of that product compared to the one they already had. It's not about right. like us throwing 60 percent on there because then you got to you got to actually do like 20 or 30 of them to make any actual money. And it doesn't make sense. You know what we found and we've done heavy analysis on this. If a client makes zero change orders, we make the most amount of money uh, because we're just zooming through that process. And again, it's because we have everything pre-planned in advance, which is challenging to do, but we're able to just zoom through the rest of it. Um, when change orders come in and slow down the project, now you have all of those indirect costs yeah. that are delayed, insurance, port johns right? Uh, salaries, those kind of things really start um, eating into your, your profit much more than what you would receive over a change order. Right. And when you start doing some of this analysis this is a question I've always wanted to ask, and, and, and a few builders do know this, do you break it down like, do you know your cost of uh, every day longer on a job than you are? Like, is it $200 a day? Is it $2,000 a day? Do you guys have that broken down? Absolutely. Um, so, so we actually look at it based on an ROI. So every two weeks of delay is uh, one point of an ROI loss or gain. It's that significant. Now, it depends on the type of projects. You know, we, we, our entry level is a million dollar project and we go up to 6 million. So obviously the cost of the project and the delay will change, but we analyze that pretty carefully um, so that we understand what our, what our total projected profit would be on the project. That's awesome. How far do you cascade that information within your team? You know, there's a philosophy where as far down as you, you go, you're going to get the most benefit out of it. Do you follow that or, or what's your thought there? Absolutely. Everybody in our company is connected to what we call a company dashboard, and it shows the profitability, gross profit, uh, so that you can truly see what the, the profit on the specific project is. Uh, and we send that to every single member of our team. Wow. Um, and, and we talk about it once a week. So during our project overview weekly meeting, which is basically our just project weekly meetings that we have, um, we pull out that dashboard and say, OK, you just lost three days and you just lost three thousand dollars. Why? And it's marked on red. Nobody wants to be on red. Uh, the, the, the builders want to. Wow. Uh, if it's on green, that means they save time or they save money or a combination. And so we we look at that uh, very directly, uh, very carefully to make sure that we're not missing days or we're not missing money. Uh, mostly just through through losses, right? Are are your houses clean? Are your you know LVLs laying in the mud? Are you having to bring in? Um, especially services to, to redo things. How organized are you? That's really where, where we see most of the losses because we're so organized up front. Man, you guys sound like a tech company. <laughs> <laughs> it was just great. I mean, talk about data and, uh, you know, insights. I mean, when did you start doing stuff like that? And like, you know, for the listeners who should, if you're a business owner in construction, should be doing exactly what you're doing. I'm sure you've seen the benefits of it throughout your team. Like, how did you get started on that? And like, what are you actually using for a dashboard? Well, I'm a, I'm a computer nerd. So I was, I have a computer science degree oh, okay. um, and I worked at IBM for eight years. And part of my tenure there was as a process consultant. So uh, I understand the concepts of technology and processes and how efficient you have to be because in the technology world, if you're creating a software, if it doesn't tick and tie correctly, the whole thing crashes. Uh, it's not like a house where if it doesn't tick and tie together, you can just, you know, you can fix that one portion. 
um, and the person can still move in. So we, you know, we have incredible amount of processes in our company, um, and it stems from that. And and the last, you know, eleven years of work that we've been doing to to perfect those processes as best as we can. It's construction; nothing's perfect, but we can we thrive for perfection on following the process. Wow! So your background at IBM showed you how being efficient, having a process for everything, you know, delivers at the end. How did you get into construction then? Where, what was that leap about? Uh, just wanting to be out of corporate America, um, seeing an opportunity. Uh, family was dabbled in real estate and saw an opportunity and um, put my resignation in and just uh, just went for it. It was a, it was a tough decision, but uh, but a worth worthwhile. That's interesting. We always talk about this on the podcast, especially when we're talking to company owners like yourself is like that leap into your own business, whether you were on a framing crew or had a framing company and said, Hey, you should start your own building business. And you went and did it, or you went from corporate America. Um, a lot of guys in your position, I would assume would maybe do one foot in one foot out and like maybe start it like a sort of a side project, like a home, if you had the capital and still stay employed, your decision was just to do full leap. Well, I, I started with some, you know, I, I went and got my um, my MBA in real estate and finance so I could understand it. I was leaning more towards investment modeling um, in real estate, uh, purchased a few properties and realized that I needed to do some renovations on those properties. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and, and you know, as the renovations continued, I realized that the, the, the more of a home you can build, the more opportunities you have, you know, you, you you know, if it's if it's a complete teardown, there's a lot of opportunity for for profits there. So, uh, so that's how I kind of built into it, and then eventually my wife um, helped me with the business as I was still at IBM, and it was essentially her business, and I was I was helping her on the weekends, and then um, and then about six months into it, we realized wow, there's there's a lot of possibility here, and that's where I put my resignation. In. That's awesome. What a great story. So here we are, 2021. You guys. You guys said that you had a record 2020, even though you basically had three months of dead time, like most of us. So that window is shorter for some people. Um, you know, you're obviously in the southeast, um, and now 2021, you're having your best projection. I, I had a question about projections. I know this is supposed to be about COVID, but we're going to talk about 2021 because I think this is helpful for a lot of other business owners out there in construction. You said you were projecting somewhere in the 60 million uh, of new sales in 2021. How do you guys back into that as a, as a business? Like, where do you, where do you start with your sales projections? And you can tell as much as you'd like, but I think maybe help some other owners out there. If they don't project the next year, how would you recommend they start doing that? Um, I think you have to project. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. And so we, uh, we analyze our, um, what we have uh, in as far as our pipeline, and we know we have a conversion rate of around 15 to 20 percent uh, based on specific, you know, uh, where we stand. So in Builder Trend, which we use as our CRM tool, we have a confidence meter. And if we're at a 60 percent confidence, we know that we have certain odds of, of closing that deal. So we've we've analyzed all that. We know that that we have if we just take historical precedence, we should be able to land a certain amount of those those deals. Um, in addition to that, we we're also a developer, so we own land through investment models, uh, and so we know that we're going to be building a certain amount of spec homes. Uh, we know historically a certain amount of those houses will um, additional lots will turn into custom pre-sales. So we're taking kind of a combination of all of those ideas, um, and again using historical data and analysis to project where we're going to be. Uh, we have sales teams. Um, you know, if we're gonna if we're dealing with a real estate environment, we use Berkshire Hathaway, and they help us depending on the areas. We have three different divisions, so three different uh, real estate teams within Berkshire Hathaway, and they support us in those different areas. And they they tell us where their projections are as well. So it's a collaborative effort to come up with where we need to go, and then we break it down. Once we have our yearly goals, we break it down, and and every single salesperson knows where they need to be in the next thirty days. Wow. Great stuff right there. Uh, for, for people who are not doing that, it's super important, but the whole, the whole backbone of it all is you got to track it somewhere to even be able to look back. Sure. Right. And sure. that's, that's well, the king. Well, prior to this, you know, we had our 
five-year planning review with our senior staff. So we came up and created, um, I, I, again, being a consultant at IBM, uh, I used a lot of the skill sets I had there to create this, this one-day seminar. Um, and we used thoughts from the one thing book of how you analyze and figure out what's the most important thing that you need to do for the day. Um, and then we took um, the Eisenhower five, four quadrant concept of what's important versus urgent. So once we created our SWOT with our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we put it all together and we created our five-year uh, plan. And then we backed that out from five years to one year to say, okay, what do we need to do within the next one year to accomplish these five-year goals? And then we even backed it further down into 30 days. So now we all, all senior leaders have our next 30 day marching orders of, of where we need to be in order to hit our goals um, for the five year plan. Wow. So the importance of bringing your senior, senior leadership in, obviously that's just to get their buy-in and, and, and them be a part of the process and goals, obviously also teaching them some business acumen and, and some personal, you know, organizational stuff like, you know, the most important thing of the day, that kind of thing. Right. Well, it's more than that. We're, we're not a, dictatorship right um we're we're a very much a democracy within our company um we have incredible culture because of it uh, everyone knows that there were we run our business like a family-oriented business uh, we're always thriving to live above the line and being completely transparent to everybody so the senior managers are basically creating the vision for the five-year goal uh, it's not just me coming down. I mean, obviously, I'm very influential on it, but we're wanting to make sure that everybody has a say in where we're going, um, and we use everybody's ideas. I, I'm 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 not a um, I'm a humble builder to where I can you know I I don't mind if somebody challenge. In fact, I want people on my team to challenge me to come up with new ideas. Yeah, as they say, if you're an owner of a business, the last thing you want to do is be the smartest guy in the room, right? When you got all your employees exactly. out there, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Man, you've got a lot of great, well, first of all, do you consult? So if so, give me your phone number to all other home builders out there because they could use some of this. <laughs> this is how you set up a business. I, I have not yet, but I do give, uh, give advice here and there. All right. Well, they can connect with you uh, through LinkedIn or Instagram, I'm sure. You guys got have a nice website. I was just out there. You guys have built build, build trend for many years. We appreciate that. Uh, and you also said that you guys are looking to, or you already have expanded into another state. Um, so what was that decision process like, and what are some of the challenges that come with, with that sort of expansion, whether it's another location or it's another location in another state? Sure. So, uh, we had two divisions, Atlanta and then North Metro Atlanta, probably about 45 minutes, maximum an hour away. You know, Atlanta traffic is pretty heavy. Um, we had, you know, as part of our five-year goal last year, we said we want to go into a new market. And we analyzed everything within a four to five hour drive time around Atlanta. So, you know, Florida came up, uh, parts of Alabama, uh, the mountains of Georgia. Uh, you know, we were really looking at where is the best place to, to move into. Um, Highlands and Cashiers, uh, North Carolina, is, is very similar uh, demographics to what we currently sell. In fact, 60 to 70% of people that buy a second home there come from Atlanta and we're selling to, you know, high end luxury, you know, people, very affluent, very wealthy. And so it just made sense. We're, we're not having to advertise to a different demographic. We're still going after the, the athletes, the, um, the doctors, the lawyers, the business owners, the producers. So it just made sense to to naturally go into that area. Hilos and Cashiers is probably um, one of the wealthiest mountain communities um, east of the Mississippi. Wow. Um, you know, definitely in the southeast. So it just it was a natural fit. We did a lot of research. I think it was nine months of, of due diligence to make sure that this was something we wanted to do. It's two and a half hours away from Atlanta. Um, you know, is it worth the time? Is it worth the drive? Uh, we have a lot going on in Atlanta and, uh, and Metro Atlanta. So it, it wasn't that we had to, but we did want to open up and to diversify our portfolio. And, um, and it just seemed after all that due diligence that it made sense. Yeah. So during your five-year plan, what, what was uh, the decision? Like, why would a company want to expand? Like, why, what is it for you to say, look, we've got a good thing going here for lack of a better term, 
we're better than a lot of the other home builders here in Atlanta. And I think it's probably because of our process, right? It sounds like you guys have a great process. So is it just like, Hey, I bet we could be top tier builder somewhere else because it would be sort of the same thing. Is that, is that it? Or what is it? Partially it's really just to diversify, right? If we go into a mountain community, which is for second homes, that's a different, um, type of sale than if you're in metro atlanta and you just get trans. I mean, most of our clients are transferees um so it's just a different model and it, it felt like it gave us ability to where if um it, the diversification to where if one of our locations struggles the other one's going to pick it back up um and we find that during recessions or bad times uh different areas uh fall at different timelines so the mountain community in Cashiers and Highlands fell really in 2010, 2011, whereas Atlanta fell in 2008, 2009. Um, and so you can kind of, you know, you kind of use that diversification to help you uh, move through any bad, any of the bad times uh, if, if, if they come, right? I mean, yeah. They will come eventually yeah. in the years, you know, in the future. And you can diversify just for other business owners within your own location, right? Like, so you could decide to go into remodeling or a specific you know, style of remodeling, or you could go, you know, entry level, mid level, high end. You're saying that for you, it was important to make sure you were div diversified as a business so that just the whims of the economy don't just swipe you out. If like Atlanta lost their top five corporations or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I don't see us really growing much more than this, but it was a great diversification for what we have. But for me, um, I want to focus on a specific product and a certain level. We, we have incredible processes for our clients. The amount of energy and money that we put into pre-construction, for example, we just can't build a half a million dollar house. Um, it, there's just that much effort. Three to four people are dedicated to that house in the beginning. Um, and so we realize that we don't want to change our processes. We just want to change our location. And so now we're going to keep those same processes throughout cashiers in, in Highlands, North Carolina, as we would in Atlanta. But to diversify ourselves within Atlanta, for example, we just opened up a pool company. Oh, great. Uh, so we're now, you know, able to capture that same clientele to build a pool for them. Um, we have in-house architecture um, where we're, we're doing a lot of a lot of architecture um you know, within ourselves. And we still work with outside architects, but for those clients that just, just need something quick, we're able to, to use that. So we are diversifying ourselves into other categories, but we want to stay with the same clientele. Yeah. That's super smart because obviously pool, pool builders are like built out for like two years right now, um, which is amazing. So do you, when you do something like that, uh, do you just layer your process, maybe sort of edit a little bit, but it's sort of just, we're going to take what we do in terms of concept and we're just going to apply it to this product. It, exactly. I mean, yeah. what we found is, and we, we work with so many different pool companies and what we found is we're basically managing their pool company. Yeah. The only thing we didn't do is design the pool and we have designers on staff. Uh, we already deal with the graders, the electricians, the plumbers, uh, the concrete guys. And so it just didn't make sense. Why are we using a third party, uh, giving up some profits too. Um, but the main reason is why are we at, at, their schedule why don't we just incorporate this back into our processes and now we know exactly what we need to do throughout the process and we're controlling our own destiny on that pool. that's awesome i feel like we can just keep going for for another hour maybe we're gonna have you on in 2021 because i, I just love unpacking how you set your stuff up um you know one thing i wanted to ask you as we sort of close and, and talk about COVID again uh you had mentioned 2008 um and, you know, a lot of people who have, who've been on this regional series have, have mentioned that. Do you feel like going through that to whatever degree you were as a business at that point, um, helped you in any way or prepared you in any way for, for COVID? Yeah. I, I think I still have the scar somewhere to, to prove it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, it was, it was a tough time. Um, you know, for, for those of us that were living through 2008, 2009 with a business, I know a lot of people that that still haven't come out of it. Um, we were really fortunate that right at 2009, we we switched our model around to an investment based model, uh, meaning I had to give up 50% of my profits at that time. But I used investor models, uh, investor money, to be able to buy property, and we were doing renovations. You know, buying things on the courthouse steps. We got to the point where we were doing about 35 a year. Um, by about 2000, 
2011, 2012. So we were doing a lot of renovations, but they were flips. So that investor model is what I used to move forward to building out developments and buying land. And so that's really stabilized our business to where, you know, if we don't have a custom home come up, but we have the resources, we can just quickly do a spec home and keep our resources, you know, our slot board slotted out perfectly uh, because we can control the specs when they come in. We can't really control the, the customs when they come in. And it, it's, it, it, it always happens where there's two or three that come in at the exact same time and you're trying to diversify, you know, kind of push that out. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of great lessons that I learned. Uh, cash flow, uh, I think, is even more important than than profit uh, from my from all, you know, from what I went through in 2008, 2009. Um, not being over leveraged uh, when we do spec homes, we're not over leveraged at all. Even if we do get bank fin financing, maybe it's 50 percent loan to cost, 30 percent loan to value. Um, so. So being able to put your head down and have a strong cash position through investment model is was really important to me. Yeah, uh, probably the best lesson that I learned. Yeah, back in back in those days, it was just it it was it was about like, hey, we just need to keep jobs coming in, whether we're making a ton of money or not. We need just need to keep the wheels going on this thing. Definitely, two thousand eight and two thousand nine. So that that investment model allowed you to do a lot of volume. Maybe you weren't making the money you wanted to make, but your business survived and here we come spitting out 2011, 12, 13, then we start going again, right? Right, exactly. Awesome. We, we actually still made, those renovations were pretty good. We, we were buying things for 20 cents on the dollar, True. selling it for 20, you know, adding another 20 cents on the dollar. So we're at 40, we're selling it at 85 cents on the dollar, but a fully renovated house in the middle of a really good part of town. Um, and so everyone's looking at it going, well, I could, you know, what are the two houses that we're selling at that time? It was either, dump foreclosures or fully renovated perfect designed houses and so we were capturing both of those sides of the market so we made we made pretty good money in 2010 2011 um, but it wasn't the um it wasn't the business i really wanted to be in I, I i didn't enjoy the flipping of houses but you have to do what you have to do right, right. i mean you you have to keep the the engine going and so in 2011 is when we realized that we could get back into new construction uh, and that's where we slowly started moving away from renovations. We still handle a few renovations here and there, uh, but they're usually full full house renovations. Most of what we do are new construction. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's 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 great that you guys learned a lot in 2008, 2009, and 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 we're probably ready to apply those, you know, in March and April when we, when it was like not knowing how this was going to shake out. You know, I think I speak for the entire industry where it's it's been good for everybody in construction. Uh, and we're really happy about that. And 2021 looks like you're going to have a, a banner year. So we definitely wish you the best. Uh, really appreciate you, you unpacking um, some of your philosophy behind your business and, and really sharing a lot of how you set things up. I think that's really important for us to continue to elevate the industry. Uh, I, I think that you probably share that. And so we'll have you back on because, I, again, I have like a list of questions I didn't get to just about how no, you set it up. Love to. Look, I'll be honest with you. Builder Trend is, is part of my success. Uh, it really is. I mean, uh, we we use it as a strategic tool, um, not as a uh, oh shoot, I have to do a daily log or oh, darn, I didn't I didn't update my calendar. We're using the tool as a function of how we run our day to day business, uh, and everybody is interconnected with it. So it's a it's a big part of part of our success. Well, we appreciate that, and again, we appreciate you being being with us for a handful of years. Uh, we want to continue to be your non-equity business partner. That's how we think of ourselves here. So uh, I know you've been to Omaha a couple times for Builderton University. And when we open it back up, uh, we'll definitely send you the dates and maybe we can bring you and your team back again. Would love to. All right, man. All right. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Best of luck this year. See you. Bye-bye. Jason from Bold construction in North Carolina on, on with us. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Appreciate being uh, invited to speak today. That's great. Uh, I'm well, excited to actually get on the show. I'm a, I'm a listener, so happy to be here. That's awesome to hear. Well, we're, we're very happy to have you. Um, you know, we reached out to Jason and, and his team and just kind of wanted to get their take on what it was like to experience COVID-19 
the original um, sort of shock of, of that happening in March of last year, and then subsequently what what you've seen in your particular area uh, and some challenges you've had. So um, Jason's gracious enough to spend some time with us here. As we do with everybody who's on the podcast, Jason, let's just start with a profile of your business. We're, as, okay, as you sit perfect. today, tell us a little bit about Bold. Sure. So Bold Construction um, is a custom home company in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, we cover what we call the west side of the triangle. So if you're familiar with Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, we are mostly in Chapel Hill, Hillsborough to the north, down to Pittsburgh on the south, and dip into southwest Durham occasionally to do work. Um, we build approximately 10 custom homes per year. Our current average home price is between basically a million two and a million five is where we're averaging. Um, and we build homes, um, you know, mostly in custom home subdivisions, um, parcels that people have found, pieces of land, large acreages, and, you know, anywhere you can stick a custom home, we will build there. Great. Um, I have a staff of close to 16 people. I don't know the exact number, I probably should. Uh, full-time employees um, doing anything from accounting and finance all the way through construction management, project management, and uh, and beyond. We have been using Builder Trend for, I have to check my records, but probably close to seven years. And we love the product. And uh, we can probably accurately say we are 100% in on Builder Trend. Well, that's great to hear. And thanks for saying kind words about the product. Um, you know, I checked out your website. There's two things that, that really struck me. And I want, I want your take on this because... When you say 10 custom homes, obviously it's a, it's a, you're at a nice price point. So those are large projects, but it did seem you had a lot of people uh, for 10 homes a year. Like it was a lower volume for a good amount of uh, you know, team members. Can you talk me through that? Was that, is that a conscious decision? Is that how you're set up and you need that to, to really deliver the customer service and experience you want? Or tell us about that. Exactly. No, so we have something around here we call the exceptional building experience. And that's what we deliver. I mean, we, we deliver amazing custom homes, um, high end in the market, but we like to deliver that exceptional building experience. And in order to do that, we do need that many employees to make it work properly. Um, one of the things I did not mention is that we do some um, renovation work as well. We probably have, you know, probably 15 to 20% of our revenues in renovation work. And then we do some light commercial, um, you know, some upfits and a little bit of new new construction builds um, for light commercial. So we have a little bit more on the plate than those 10 custom homes, but our focus again is, is custom homes and providing that exceptional building experience. That's great. That makes sense. So we, you're dabbling renovation and then even light commercial, you know, you need some more expertise mm -hmm. there. And, and to deliver that exceptional building experience, yeah, it takes some people and some infrastructure. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That's awesome. The other thing I noticed on your website, and this will probably be a good lean into the COVID-19 is you get, you have all masks on your, your uh, profile of your company. Yes. Uh, was that obviously a conscious decision? What was behind that? Um, it was a conscious decision. So um, if I could go through the history of COVID again, I, I could probably tell you date by date if I check some records, but you know, essentially on March 15th is kind of when everything hit the fan mm -hmm. and we shut the office down. So, um, we shut down the office, kept people at home, did all our meetings on Zoom. Um, we did, uh, pulled people out of renovations and warranty work. So basically any occupied home, we did not let our employees go back into. Um, in North Carolina, construction was deemed an essential business, which was fortunate for us. And we were able to continue all of our new construction projects um, I believe we went back into the office on around May 15th. And a lot of this is according to kind of the state's guidelines. Um, a lot of it was really according to uh, my business partner, Chris and I's kind of decision on what we thought was actually safe. So we went back into the office on the 15th and, you know, it was kind of a mix, you know, if, if you can come to the office or you feel comfortable coming to the office, please come back. If not, let's, you know, work out, you know, some special, arrangements with with you and, and your staff and we went you know straight to masks temperatures taking people's temperatures and all and all the things to in order to keep our um, office safe 
we have, fortunately, we have a, a, a very nice office with a bunch of individual offices. Um, so we didn't, you know, we didn't have kind of a cubicle situation where we had a lot of people in the same room. So we were able to maintain distances and, you know, not put people right on top of each other for those, those reasons. And then on, on the job sites, um, we got out, you know, sanitizing, uh, signage, you know, mask, mask mandate came a little bit later on the job sites, but in general, job sites are pretty safe until you work, start working interior. And then at that point we weren't stacking subs on top of each other and let kind of let one sub work at a time. So that was, that was kind of our plan. Yeah. yeah. So you were really looking out. I mean, that's, that's a difficult thing. I know the owners of our business are uh, battled with that, but you had to look out for the business. You had to look out for the welfare of your employees, trying to cater to everybody and in, in their comfort level. And, and then of course, pulling them out of, out of the renovations and the warranty work. Was that a decision by the local government or was that a decision by you and your business partner? That was a decision made by us. Mm -hmm. You know, my business partner, I had decided that, you know, we didn't have anything that urgent in that, you know, in that category. So it was probably best until we figured out kind of how these, how the virus was working. Um, we thought it was best just to keep, keep people out of occupied homes. Yeah. You and you and your business partner, Chris, was it, was it a crazy time to say the least? Was it like sort of all hands on deck between the two of you? Yeah. I mean, it was obviously unprecedented times for everybody. Um, but Chris and I pretty, pretty quick on our feet and, you know, had some of the technology already available and have used it, you know, a lot in the past, um, just with traveling and stuff like that. So we, we were able to put it together pretty quick. My staff, very, very nimble, um, very capable. The crew, the guys that were in the field, ready to work, wanting to work, tell us what we can and can't do. Um, people that are more office-based, you know, on Zoom calls at 8 a.m., no problem. You know, every, everything worked pretty well. And, you know, Chris and I, I think we all did this, you know, went first in March, we were all watching the numbers every day, worldwide numbers, state numbers, county numbers, trying to figure out what that meant for us. Ultimately, we, we made, I thought we made, we made some pretty good decisions. I, I thought we, you know, kept our team safe while still being able to provide that experience for our client. And, and you know, certainly clients were very reasonable. The ones that we had warranty and renovation work were perfectly fine with us not being in their homes. The ones where we told them we're not certain where this is going to lead schedule wise for your jobs were fine. They said, whatever you have to do, um, you have to do and we'll, we'll accept it. But um, we did not lose much time on the front end of the COVID scare here. Um, we, we're losing more, quite honestly, on the back end with supply chain issues and material shortages and stuff like that. Okay, that's interesting. Let's talk about that. So there were a lot of companies that we spoke to on this podcast back in the second quarter of last year uh, that really did see a, a full stop in terms of leads and like that part of their business. And that came back for almost everybody in a couple of months, which was great for this industry. But we always did talk about this supply chain and, and that's got that tailwind of like, what, six to eight months until we start or now we're seeing the effect of that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, more or less. I mean, so we're, we were the same way, you know, once March 15th hit, we were, we were dead in the water on sales and didn't pick back up until um, probably August, early September. And then kind of the floodgates opened and we can kind of get into what that means later. Mm -hmm. um, in our discussions, but, uh, as far as the supply chain issues, so the, the way, you know, the way I heard it, what from my suppliers was that a bunch of mills shut down immediately. And then once everyone realized, Hey, the demand is there and it's growing, they picked them back up. So we, so we had lost some timing on the front end of that, um, just based on that's more, you know, lumber commodity stuff. And then we're seeing a lot of, you know, lead times that were three to four days are now four to six weeks. You know, oh, wow. Things that, you know, are kind of unheard of in our business. And, you know, we had to completely adjust our template schedule and builder trend in order to account for all these changes. Um, and, you know, our schedules in general, obviously, had to be adjusted to account for those. So right now, you know, it's, it's really miscellaneous stuff that, you know, we need a certain color of a specific piece of decking board and it's not available. Whereas, you know, last, you know, early last year, 20, 
2019, it would have been there. Mm-hmm. And it would have, you know, been three days, three days out. Now it's six weeks out and we kind of have to, you know, reassess what we're doing um, with the schedule. So what, what do your suppliers and your vendors um, say to you now uh, as we look into next year? Is there going to be some, some time frame when we're back to normalcy as relates to supplying and, and ordering things like that? Well, I hate to use this term, but the new normal might be things just take longer to get than they had in the past. And I think what our, you know, our vendors are trying to keep us up to date on how long things are taking to get so we can properly prepare and schedule accordingly. But I, I think, I mean, certainly everyone, we're, we're a uh, hopeful species. Everyone believes that we're going to be back to normal at some point. And hopefully that means the construction and supply chain world will be as well. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see how it goes over the next couple of months here or, or the whole year. Now, you had mentioned that floodgates sort of opened up. And I, I think, you know, you and I had a separate conversation before this and you had talked about how there was a couple of things that changed for the better, I guess. And I don't want to put words in your mouth as it relates to this COVID-19. Uh, is that what you're talking about there? New opportunities? Yeah, I for mean, you? so, yeah. So, I mean, obviously I'm a micro organization in the, in the whole building world, but I will speak from, from my, our experience. So we're, you know, again, 10 custom homes a year is what we're shooting for, you know, providing that uh, exceptional experience. Um, but the mindset of our clientele or people that are purchasing homes uh, that we build has certainly changed. Um, we've seen people moving away from like urban areas, um, not only regionally, people coming down from the Northeast, but even super locally, where people were moving out of a, the town of Chapel Hill out to the next county over, um, they're wanting more land. They're wanting, um, I wouldn't say bigger homes, but right size homes. So they're going to put in all, you know, they want to, they want every room to make sense and to use every room. Um, so they're willing to put more money into l- probably less square footage, but as long as it's the right size square footage. And, you know, I think the, the biggest change that we've seen is people focusing on that indoor outdoor living so that's you know your living room kitchen flowing onto your screen porch which flows out onto your uh, pool deck with a fire pit so i mean we're 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 seeing summer kitchens outdoor kitchens swimming pools in almost every home that we're building hot tubs fire pits um you know people wanting almost as much square footage outside as they have inside on the main level Wow, that's really interesting. So for you as a business, what does that mean for you? Does that just mean uh, more complexity in the project, a higher price point, both? Um, I would say a little bit more focus on design and needs than we'd seen in the past. Um, certainly, certainly a higher complexity. I would say that's a fair statement. And then higher price point is, you know, probably higher price per square foot plus higher total price point based on having, you know, that exterior space and, you know, swimming pools are not, uh, not inexpensive these days. Mm -hmm. Especially, yeah, there's some of the busiest, busiest trades and and contractors that are out there right now. There's some pools that are 12 to 18 months out. Uh, Good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're, you on a national level, they've had this discussion about people leaving the big metros, understanding they don't have to be in the city centers to, you know, live and work. So you're seeing that in, in, in real life. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing that locally. We're seeing people, you know, that have left, you know, some of the bigger metro areas and coming down this way. Um, That wasn't uncommon in the past, but it it kind of, I think it gave a lot of people that extra push to just go ahead and do it. Um, Certainly people being able to work from home has changed that as well. And, And because of that, quite honestly, we're seeing another design change, which is that Usually it was maybe we'll put a study in. Now it's we're definitely putting an office in mm. and then, hey, find us another spot for a second office uh, so we don't have to work in the same office, that kind of thing. Or find us a nook somewhere where I can work four or five days a week instead of going into the office. That's interesting. Yeah. So in yeah. general, when you talk about right sizing for people, that's a great example. And are they getting rid of like superfluous places like dining rooms they'll never use, formal dining rooms or like? a family room and a living room. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, I would say in general, we've seen, and the trend was happening before this, but we've definitely seen the formal dining room go away. We've seen the formal living room go away. Um, 
you know, we're even seeing the uh, bathtub in the owner suite go away and just go with a larger shower. So there's, I think there's a lot of changes um, that are happening. And, and one of the other things we're seeing is a lot of guest suites on the main level, you mm -hmm. know, so you have your owner suite on the main level and your guest suite on the main level. Um, that that's becoming more popular just with thoughts of visitors or uh, multi-generational situations, that kind of thing. Yeah. Have you guys seen a, this trend that I've seen too? Uh, and it happens typically in, in better climates, like a, a separate outdoor structure of a guest house or an office, like in a large backyard or anything like that for your renovations? Um, yeah, I'd say we have a few with that thought in mind for in design right now. We have not, I'm just trying to think if we've built anything like that. You know, we had, had a house that came out of the ground probably in 2019 that had, you know, a separate exercise room kind of on a detached garage uh, with a little summer kitchen off of that. Um, we're actually designing a multi-generational house right now that would have what we would all consider the main house. And then it has a full two bedroom um, guest house with a kitchen, kitchenette and a dining area. So yes, the, the answer is yes. People, people are looking to do that. It's not necessarily always a detached. Sometimes it's a, you know, attached or we have a, a breezeway connecting it. Wow. Uh, some definitely look at in 2021. So it sounds like you guys had a bit of a roller coaster, but in general, things are good right now. You guys are busy. Wh what do you sort of foresee for 2021? More of the same or? I mean, so far, yes. I mean, you know, we are working with more than a handful of clients right now on designs. We're expecting those designs to turn to contracts pretty quickly and, you know, expecting to get those 10 houses done in 2021, you know, at, you know, many parts of 2020 didn't think that was even going to be possible. So we're very, we're very blessed and uh, fortunate that we're here where we are. Um, but I have not, not, not seen a slowdown. I don't predict it as of yet. I mean, again, I think, I think there's been a mindset change. I don't think it's a temporary mindset change. You know, I think it's more of a, we should have been doing this all along kind of mindset. Yeah. More of a push. Um, and if, and if that's, if that's the truth, then I think our business will be pretty strong for a while. That's great. Well, it sounds like you and Chris had just yourself set up right uh, for this unpredictable pandemic as it relates to the systems you guys had at a business and you guys were using, you know, a system like Builder Trend. So you made that transition well. So kudos to you and Chris for sort of having your business in the right place. And we're fortunate to have you as a client for this many years and, and definitely uh, hope to have some for, for many more years and wish you the best, man. So thanks so much for, for coming on. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, Thank you for what you do for us. You know, we couldn't, uh, certainly couldn't do it without Builder Trend. And if I could add one more thing, having Builder Trend for out of town clients has always been a dream for them. They've been able to check in, see how the jobs are going, check pictures, all that kind of stuff. And in the COVID climate, um, we've had multiple clients from out of town that have not been able to visit their house. I mean, literally 10 months in, they haven't been able to come see their house. And, you know, Builder Trend's been a big help and making sure they know what's going on and are comfortable with moving forward without actually getting their hands on the home. That's amazing to hear. Well, thank you for those kind words. And again, we wish you guys the best. One of the best companies in North Carolina, been with us a long time. Jason, thanks so much. And uh, here's to a great 2021. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you again for tuning in to this episode of The Building Code. Make sure you subscribe and like wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, head out to Facebook and join The Building Code crew. And finally, drop me a line at podcast at buildatrend.com. We want to hear from you, suggestions on guests or topics, anything. Thanks so much for joining and appreciate you.